May a joyous Lord's Day be ours as we gather for worship. Um, with some silent prayer, let us ask God to prepare our hearts as we come to him as his people. Almighty God, from you comes every good prayer, and from you we pour out all of the spirit of grace and prayer so that we might offer to you worship which you receive from your children gladly. So deliver us as we draw near to you from things like insincere hearts and wanderings of mind. May we be steadfast, immovable, abounding in the glory that you have shown us in Christ. May our affections be fanned by the Holy Spirit into a fire that we may worship you in spirit and truth truly in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Please stand, everyone. Grace to you and peace to you from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Psalm 29 calls us to worship. Ascribe to the Lord, O sons of the mighty. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. Worship the Lord in holy array. So you array of saints, let us turn to song number 29, please. In Christ alone, our opening song for this morning.
Brothers and sisters, please join me as we pray. Almighty God, who's created the sea, the dry land, the stars in the heavens, and all things, and then filled them with all of your works, displaying your salvation to your people by also speaking through your Son, Jesus Christ, and in your word. The rivers and mountains declare your praise, all creation declares their beginning is from you, and they tell forth your coming righteous judgment. Out of your mercy, you have given us the word of your grace and love for we, your people, by sending your Son to bear our sin on the cross. Father, you receive flawed and crooked children because Jesus has made all things straight and new. You've gathered us to join with joy in praising you for your judgments. So may we do, O Lord, in honoring and glorifying your name through the worship of our lips and hearts. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Please be seated, all. The scriptures in Romans 3.20 teach that through the law comes knowledge of our sin. The Apostle Paul speaks in Romans 7:7 7, 7 and says, I would not have known sin except through the law. So the law shows us our sin and consequently our need for Christ. Paul again says in Galatians 3:24, the Lord has become our tutor. I'm sorry, the law has become our tutor to lead us to Christ that we may be justified by faith. Let us then, with this use of the law in mind, read the law of God as it's found in the Ten Commandments in Exodus chapter 20, that we may see our peril and our need of Christ, and Christ alone for salvation. <clears throat> Exodus chapter 20. Then God spoke all these words, saying, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an idol or any likeness of what is in heaven above or on the earth beneath or in the water under the earth. You shall not worship them or serve them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children on the third and fourth generations of those who hate me, but showing loving kindness to thousands, to those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not leave him unpunished who takes his name in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy, Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall not do any work. You or your son or your daughter, your male or your female servant, your cattle or your sojourner who stays with you. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Honor your father and your mother, that your days may be prolonged in the land which the Lord your God gives you. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his male servant or his female servant or his ox, or his donkey, or anything that belongs to your neighbor. All the people perceived the thunder and lightning flashes and the sound of the trumpet and the mountain smoking. And when the people saw it, they trembled and stood at a distance. Then they said to Moses, Speak to us yourself, and we will listen, but let not God speak to us, or we will die. Moses said to the people, 
Do not be afraid, for God has come in order to test you, and in order that the fear of him may remain with you, so that you may not sin. Turn to the back of the bulletin, and we'll read that prayer of confession on the back page there in unison. Brothers and sisters, together then. Almighty God, you are rich in mercy to all who call upon you. Hear us as we come to you, confessing our sins and begging your mercy and forgiveness. We have broken your holy laws by our deeds and by our words. We have broken your holy laws by the sinful affections of our hearts. We confess before you that we are disobedient, ungrateful, prideful, and willful. Merciful Lord, all our failures and shortcomings toward you and toward others rise to you as a sin against your holy name. Forgive us, most merciful Father, and from your great goodness grant that we may hereafter serve and please you in newness of life and through the merit and mediation of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. From Psalm 130, verses 3 and 4. If you, O Lord, should mark iniquities, O Lord, who could stand? But there is forgiveness with you, that you may be feared. Know that if you fear God and repent, that God has forgiven you in Christ. Now I'm going to ask the deacons to come forward and take the offering. As they're doing that, listen to the words of Romans chapter 15, verses 25 through 27. I am going to Jerusalem, serving the saints, for Macedonia and Achaia have been pleased to make a contribution for the poor among the saints in Jerusalem. Yes, they were pleased to do so, and they are indebted to them. For if the Gentiles have shared in their spiritual things, they are indebted to minister to them also in material things. This is especially applicable that we're going to be taking both the regular offering and the deacon's offering this morning. Uh, let us pray.
Let's all stand, please. <clears throat> Turn your hymnals to number 701. Redeemed how I love to proclaim it. Number 701. sit down first and then I'd like to call up uh, Bill and John and Stu to come up in front here. As they're making their way and uh, getting situated, um, we're going to be installing um, John as a deacon, a reinstalling I guess. We had to fix you and then reinstall you. Um, then we're going to be uh, also reinstalling Bill and Stu as uh, elders. Um, the office of ruling elder is based on the kingship of our Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, it is the duty and privilege of what we call ruling elders um, in the name and by the authority of our King Jesus to rule and govern uh, together and jointly with the pastor, the church, as servants of the great shepherd as under-shepherds to care for the flock entrusted to them. That's why Scripture is so clear to say, Take heed unto yourselves and to all the flock, in which the Holy Spirit has made you bishops, to feed the church of God which he purchased with his own blood. Such a precious purchase of God. Therefore, as a consequence, ruling elders have to be zealous. Um, and maintaining the purity and ministration of the word and sacraments. They must conscientiously exercise discipline and uphold the good order and peace of the church. With love, of course, and with humility, harder, but of course, they should promote faithfulness on the part of both elders and deacons in the discharge of their duties. Moreover, and they have particular regard to the doctrine and conduct of the minister of the word. And may I ask you to have all of God's grace in carrying that duty out. In order that the church may be edified and manifest itself truly as the pillar and ground of the truth. Deacons are based on the solicitude, the peace, the the. the, the the kindness and love of Christ for his own people. They minister to physical needs, and in the beginning, the apostles themselves uh, ministered to the poor, but they found that the work to doing that was better handled by delegating it to men who were uh, 
themselves full of the Holy Spirit, had good report, and full of wisdom. And since the days of the apostle of the church, uh, since the days of the apostle of the church, the, the office um, of deacon and their ministry of care of the poor and needy is a distinct ministry of the church, which the deacons exercise under their own authority. The duties of deacons consist of encouraging members of the church to provide for those who are in want. We demonstrated some of that just a minute ago. Seeking to prevent poverty, uh, making discreet and cheerful distribution to the needy, and praying with the distressed and reminding them of the consolations of Holy Spirit, Holy Scripture. For deacons and elders, if they are to fill worthily so sacred an office, deacons must and elders must adorn their lives with sound doctrine and holy living, setting an example of godliness. Let them walk with exemplary piety and diligently discharge their obligations. For the reward is that when the chief shepherd appears, they shall receive a crown of glory that does not fade away. So your reward is in heaven on this one. <clears throat> so, gentlemen, all three of you, John, Bill, and Stu, do you agree as, to serve as ruling elder or deacon, as the case may be, in this congregation and promise in reliance on the grace of God to faithfully perform all the duties thereof? I do. Um, as a reminder, um, these men are already ordained, and so they've taken vows of ordination with respect to um, their commitment to the infallibility of the scriptures, their um, receiving and adopting the confession of faith and catechism of this church, the approving of the government discipline and worship of the Orthodox Presbyterian Church, that's our book of order, and promise to seek the purity, peace, and unity of the church, and promise to God also to accept this office, and promise and reliance on God's grace to faithfully perform all the duties attached to it. Now you, the members of Christ Presbyterian Church, do you acknowledge and receive these brothers as elders and deacon, and do you promise to yield to them all that honor, encouragement, and obedience in the Lord to which these offices, according to the word of God and the constitution of this church, entitles them? Just say, I do. <clears throat> I now declare that John Sebasma, Bill Meather, and Stu Bjork have been regularly elected and installed as ruling elders and deacon in this church, as it applies agreeable to the word of God according to the constitution of the Orthodox Presbyterian Church and that they are entitled to all the honor, encouragement, and obedience in the Lord to which his office, their office, entitles them. As they sit down, um, our, uh, our privilege now, um, indeed uh, a great privilege, which belongs only to the children of God, is to pray together and be heard in the, thorn, in the throne room of heaven. So let us pray together, um, and please join me as we do. Our Father in heaven, we... We call you Father because you have made us your children by adopting us into your fold because of Christ's work. You have told us that you are a Father who knows how to care for his children, that you are always able and ready to help us. So we ask, first of all, O Lord, that your holy name be upon our hearts and lips, enable us and others to glorify you. In every way you've made yourself known, especially in how you have made yourself known in the gospel, and according to the word of God and in the church, the visible church which disposes all things to your glory by your grace. May your people that are called by your name glorify you in love and service for and with each other and in your sight. We pray, O Lord, for your kingdom, for your kingdom to come and Satan's kingdom to be destroyed. And let the kingdom of your grace 
be advanced and expanded. May it reach to every corner of this world. We pray for these, these men in our congregation who recently were installed. Oh Lord, we, we pray that the years ahead in their service might be full of encouragement and um, also wisdom and love for you. And may they not waver in the faithful completion of their duties in their office. May they live by grace and with love and everything to your glory. We pray for the saints at Five Solas Church in Reedsburg, Wisconsin, and for uh, Pastor McShaffrey there. Um, we pray for a particular, um, a particular situation there uh, with a married couple and ask that you would break through the resistance um, that is currently there and uh, bring repentance and reconciliation. Um, Lord, we pray also for the unsaved. We pray for those who do not know you. We pray for those who govern our world. We ask you to have mercy upon our president and our vice president and our governor, indeed all of our elected officials. Lord, we know that our home is in another world. Yet, Lord, you've asked us and commanded us to pray that we would have quiet lives of dignity and godliness when we pray for the for the discharge of those who um, care for the safety and security of our world. Let them all do their work as unto you. May your will be done, O Lord, among us. Lord, the hard shells of our hearts often get worn with calloused as we avoid what we ought to do or do what we should not do. Break through, O oh Lord, our hardened hearts, that we may be willing always to do your will. Crack open the shell of resistance and instead infuse us with teachability. Put to death, O oh Lord, the self-justification we love so much and grant us repentance. Lord, Strengthen our faith to believe this and all things in your word and to do them without hesitation. Lord, we pray that you would give us our daily bread and the needs of this life. We are struck with the various gifts you've shown um, through those who, who are connected with our congregation this past week. Um, we give you thanks for the skill you have granted medical people as we uh, marvel at the a heart transplant being done on Sherry Canton, Brian's sister. We pray for her continued health and for her to improve. We, we thank you for wise counsel. We thank you for the truth of your word, for the salvation which is found in Christ, because blessed to you are the death of your saints. We pray for the Ott family in Rockford. We pray for and thanksgiving for food and clothing and warm homes, especially this week. For those who are deprived of these things, may we not close our eyes or hearts to them. We pray for those confused or stressed, lonely. We pray for them to have comfort. We also pray that you would forgive us our sins as we forgive those that sin against us. Now in silence we ask you, Lord, to call to mind those that we should, that we should forgive and to also ask for your forgiveness. Lord, we know that living in this world is one that is fraught with trials, with difficulties. You've promised this to us. You have told us it. Lord, we, we pray that we might see the way that this world is 
and that it may drive us not to outrage, but to longing for heaven. May we not love this world so much that we think it is the only world. Deliver us, O Lord, from the evil one who leads us into temptation or attempts to. Keep us, Lord, from being tempted and deliver us when we are tempted. Strengthen our hearts and minds as we suffer physical ailments to help us to trust you. Lord Jesus, when you were tempted by Satan in the desert, he offered you kingdom, power, and glory. It was, of course, a lie that he could ever offer such things to you. And you being you showed us how to resist the devil and have him flee from us. These were not his to give, for you already possessed them. Give us discerning hearts and fill us with your Holy Spirit that we may see lies and not listen to the father of lies. May our prayers, O Lord, reach you and may we take our encouragement from you alone as we ascribe kingdom and power and glory to you and in testimony of all our desires and in proclamation of the assurance we have in our hearts that we are heard in our prayers through Jesus Christ, we all say, Amen. Amen. <clears throat> Stay seated, everyone, and turn to hymn number 727 as we prepare to hear God's word today. Brothers and sisters, please turn in your Bibles to the 15th chapter of the book of Romans. We're reading from verse 18 through 21 this morning. Romans 15, 18 through 21. For I will not presume to speak of anything except what Christ has accomplished through me resulting in the obedience of the Gentiles by word and deed, in the power of signs and wonders, in the power of the Spirit, so that from Jerusalem and round about as far as Illyricum, I have fully preached the gospel of Christ. And thus I aspired to preach the gospel, not where Christ was already named, so that I would not build on another man's foundation, but as it is written, they who had no news of him shall see, and they who have not heard shall understand. Now from Isaiah chapter 52, verse 13 through 53, verse 12. <clears throat> 
Behold, my servant will prosper, and he will be high and lifted up and greatly exalted. Just as many were astonished at you, so his appearance was marred more than any man, and his form more than the sons of men. Thus he will sprinkle many nations. Kings will shut their mouths on account of him, and what had not been told them they will see, and what they had not heard they will understand. Who has believed our message, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a tender shoot, and like a root out of parched ground. He has no stately form or majesty that we should look upon him, nor appearance that we should be attracted to him. He was despised and forsaken of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And like one from whom men hide their face, he was despised, and we did not esteem him. Surely our griefs he himself bore, and our sorrows he carried. Yet we ourselves esteemed him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was pierced through for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The chastening of our well-being fell upon him, and by his scourging we are healed. All of us like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way. But the Lord has caused the iniquity of us all to fall on him. He was oppressed and he was afflicted. Yet he did not open his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to slaughter and like a sheep that is silent before its shearers. So he did not open his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away. And as for his generation, who considered that he was cut off out of the land of the living for the transgression of my people to whom the stroke was due. His grave was assigned with wicked men, yet he was with a rich man in his death. Because he had done no violence, nor was there any deceit in his mouth. But the Lord was pleased to crush him, putting him to grief, if he would render himself as a guilt offering. He will see his offspring. He will pro prolong his days. And the good pleasure of the Lord will prosper in his hand. As a result of the anguish of his soul, he will see it and be satisfied. By his knowledge, the righteous one, my servant, will justify the many. And he will bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will allot him a portion with the great, and he will divide the booty with the strong, because he poured himself out to death and was numbered with the transgressors, and he himself bore the sin of many and interceded for the transgressors. Let us pray. Almighty God, who grants all things which are good to us, we, we know that without you we we cannot, without your grace, we cannot please you. We therefore ask that we would, as we hear your word, that your Holy Spirit would direct all of our thoughts concerning it and may rule in our hearts through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. There are a lot of miracles in the Bible. You're probably aware of that. As believers, we certainly should affirm and defend the scripture's testimony of them, but I wonder if there's a, a miracle that we often forget when we think about miracles in the Bible. <clears throat> it's found at Romans chapter 4, verse 5. And simply this. God justifies the ungodly. <laughs> now the world says that everybody knows that God punishes bad people and rewards good people. Right? It just makes sense, right? That's what God does. But that is not what the gospel says, is it? The gospel says God declares guilty people innocent. He justifies the ungodly. In other words, God treats bad people as if they're good people. It doesn't matter what your perspective is, what politics you have, what, what, um, where, where you grew up. You define things in your life as right or wrong. You form judgments 
You may even expect God to approve those judgments and do the same. But at some point you're going to be struck with the very difficult problem of how to answer the question, how can God treat bad people as good people? Is that even fair to the good people? Is there no justice? You know where I'm going, right? It's a good thing that God does treat bad people as good people. All of us, every one, every single one, is ungodly, you know. You know that. We don't like to admit it. Um, we don't, we sometimes even deny it in our hearts. Uh, we know that we are not godly, really, we do. We've fallen short, but we don't like to think about it. So we kind of cover it up in our minds. We ignore it. We say to ourselves, don't think about that too much. That's a really hard thing to think about. I, I would rather prefer to think of myself as, as a good person. Or you can say something like, I, I could be a good person except for this or that. Or better yet, if you can find someone else to blame for your inability to be a good person, even better, right? There's a reason why we do that. Shift blame off ourselves, ignore ourselves, and the ungodliness we have. That's a, there's a reason why our problems always seem to be somebody else's fault. Why we always point fingers and self-justify. It's because we know we're not godly. The reason we pass on blame is we know we cannot bear our guilt ourselves. We know that we can't. We want others to bear it for us, so we dump it on them without even noticing that we're doing it in our thoughts or hearts. This is a major source of tension among people in families and homes and churches all over the world. Now, we're not just talking about guilty feelings here. Our problem is something called objective moral guilt before God. It's not that we feel guilty or feel bad for doing something bad. No, we have offended and piled up guilt before God. Romans 3, 19. Now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be closed and all the world may become accountable to God. We realize something very chilling. That we, if we are made to answer for what we've done, will be slayed. Now the question then is what makes this burden truly go away? What, what actually can be done? Who can bear this for us? I know you know the answer to this, but you still need to hear it. He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we may die to sin and live to righteousness for by his wounds you were healed. The love of Christ toward us in this all, he says in effect, at my cross, it's my job to be slayed for the sins of others, to bear their guilt because I love sinners. He says to us, do you trust me? Yes? then here is how it will be. My only guilt will be yours, and your only righteousness will be mine. That's the terms. If you don't trust me, Jesus says, then you will have to continue to deal with your guilt on your own. How's that going? That God justifies ungodly people through the work of Jesus Christ on the cross is a true miracle. It is an intervention by the Creator into the creation, into the lives, and yes, the hearts and wills, without their permission, of foolish people, proud people, shameful people, unacceptable people, immoral people, helpless people, all of them. For as the scripture says, he alone is just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. 
In some of the preceding chapters, Isaiah has spoken of a deliverer of the Jewish people from their captivity in Babylon, and that has been Cyrus. Over and over again, that deliverer has been shown us. But three servant songs since chapter 40 has taught us something. Mixed in as they are with all the prophecies about Cyrus, these servant songs serve to remind us that Isaiah has a much greater deliverer in mind than a pagan king of a foreign land, Cyrus. For the work that Cyrus is going to do is nothing but a shadow of the work which Christ will do. This famous passage, Isaiah 52, 13 through Isaiah 53, 12, is also known as the Song of the Suffering Servant. And it is the longest and most specific representation of the Deliverer to come in the whole Old Testament. That Deliverer, Jesus Christ, fulfills all of what it says. And only He does. There are certain passages in the Bible, especially in Isaiah, uh, that were of great importance to the, to the life and ministry of Jesus. Every verse of this song, this song of the suffering servant, except for two, and I would even make the case that I could find places where that would be true, uh, verses 14 of chapter 52 and verses 2 of, of chapter 53, every one of the verses, except for those two possibly, is applied to Jesus in the New Testament. Some verses in Isaiah 53 are applied several times. And John Stott says, Indeed, there is good evidence that Jesus' whole public career, from his baptism through his ministry, sufferings and death, to his resurrection and ascension, is seen as a fulfillment of the, of the pattern foretold in the song of the suffering servant. Now, I am afraid that attempting to deal with all the content of this passage in one or two or three or four or possibly even five sermons might be analogous to taking the wonders of the Smithsonian Institution while driving a race car through the place. There are vast treasures beyond price in this section of the scripture. So let's, uh, let's, let's, let's downshift, tap the brakes a little, let's not rush. Every part of this song is worth savoring. The outline in the bulletin you have shows five stanzas of the song. We'll be going through each five, each one of them, separately. Today, we'll be looking at the first stanza, which is in 52, 13 through 15, and I'm calling it the stumbling block and rock of offense. Now, the reason I'm doing that is because Isaiah 8.14, from where we get that phrase, uh, talks about that uh, he, that is the, the, the promised one, shall become a sanctuary. But to both houses of Israel, a, store, a stone to strike and a rock to stumble over, and a snare and a trap for the inhabitants of Jerusalem. In Isaiah 8, God is bringing the people of Israel short because of their false religions and their self-reliance. And that will be their undoing as they look for everywhere else but God's word for wisdom. He even says later in that chapter of chapter 8 in Isaiah, Consult the mediums and spiritists who whisper and mutter. Should not a people consult their God? Should they consult the dead on behalf of the living? To the law and to the testimony. But, he says, they will look to the earth and behold distress and darkness, gloom of anguish, and they will be driven away into darkness. What we want to see today is that the true wisdom of God is that the undeserved sufferings of Jesus Christ remove our guilt and outperform the best this world offers for antidotes for guilt, and does so not just overwhelmingly, but infinitely. Seeing here, therefore, in Isaiah 52, 13 through 15, three displays of God's wisdom in the servant who suffers. Three displays of God's wisdom 
in the servant who suffers. The first of these is, I would guess I would call it the, the, the fact upon which the other two points are built. It is verse 13. God is speaking, and he gives us a command. This word behold is not um, like an abracadabra word. It's a, it's a word which means look, examine, study, pay attention to this. And he says, behold my servant. It's the last in a bunch of commands that started in chapter 51 uh, that were all hinting at redemption but lacked explanation as to how they would come about. We were told to listen and to pay attention, to lift up our eyes, to, to, to prick our ears, to awake, to arouse ourselves, to, to listen, and then to depart, finally, in the last chapter. Now God reveals who is going to make this all happen. And he says, behold, this guy, this servant that you've heard from before, nothing new am I going to tell you here. But now, behold my servant and what he did. He means study. He means pay attention. He means spend yourself in the understanding of this servant who I have exalted. It is God in heaven giving testimony and putting an, a, a, a seal of approval on the work of Christ in doing this. He says prosper. Also, you could say act wisely. Ultimately, it is um, a, a wide field of meaning, that word in the first line there. My servant will prosper, act wisely, have success, will accomplish exactly what needs to be done so that my will is accomplished. That's, that's what it means with respect to Christ. Christ acts with wisdom to know exactly what to do in any given situation so as to bring about the intended result of glorifying his Father, which he was sent to do, by redeeming his people. In Christ's case, that's just exactly what it is. It's, it's, it's referring to his whole prophetic, uh, or his whole work on the cross and in the resurrection, his prophetic work, his, his, his king work, and his work also to be a priest, to offer sacrifice. It is God speaking here concerning the servant, and he gives the witness that he is high and lifted up and exalted. Many scholars think, and I, I, I happen to agree with them, they take those three words for exaltation, high, lifted up, and exalted, and they say this does indicate the threefold exaltation of Christ. Well, I think that's exactly right. Jesus rose from the dead, he ascended to heaven, and reigns on high with all power and authority. He is high and lifted up and exalted. So when we think of Jesus in his work, he is to be not pitied, not, not thought of as a, a defeated, crucified um, Savior, but to be worshipped because he is a glorified ruler of heaven and earth. His suffering is not as though he has not had triumph over his suffering. God is commanding us to behold and see Jesus, to know and study him well, his person and his work, but to do more than just look, to bow down and worship him because he is the exalted one. In 1 Peter 2.8, he says that he has become a rock of stumbling and offense to some because they do not believe in the risen Savior. That itself is a stumbling block to the wisdom of the world. It sees not a savior, not a servant, not a, a triumph, but a crucified man. And that doesn't look like a servant or anyone who would help us. And that leads us to the first reaction to this exaltation. And remember that this exaltation was something God in heaven proclaimed. It wasn't like he's going to get it someday or whatever. He is exalted. The reaction of the world toward this exalted Savior is revulsion, reviling, hating. The word here in, chapter, in verse 14 of Isaiah 52 is the word astonished in the translation I read. But um, a, 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 I think a better a translation is appalled, um, repulsed is another word. 
Following on that is this idea, his appearance was marred more than any man, his form taken down, degraded more than any of the sons of men. Isaiah connects the two phrases in 14 and 15, um, as many as were appalled or astonished, all right, he connects that to the words, so he shall sprinkle. So uh, however repulsive Jesus had become in his suffering, and he had been beat on and scourged and tortured and nailed to a cross and made to die and been pierced through, had been mocked, had been degraded in every way, no matter how repulsive he was, no matter how deep his humiliation, that's how deep he is effective in cleansing us. That's the grammatical construction here in verses 14 and 15. He was marred, borrowing a word from Malachi 1.14 of a blemished animal offered. They, he was regarded by the Jews as marred and blemished. But he cannot be marred or blemished because he is the God-man. He is the holy servant of God. He is the man who dies for others. And so when he goes to sprinkle the nations, we are forced to take in that the very one who is thought by many to be unclean is in fact the one who cleanses. And so the, 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 the overturning of the wisdom of men in their revulsion toward the servant is God's work so clearly and so undeniably and it is glorious because he comes to cleanse all of his people. He sprinkles on, like the Day of Atonement in Leviticus 16. The priest was to go into the Holy of Holies and take the blood of the bull that he offered for himself and put it on the mercy seat. And then he was going to slay the goat which took upon the sins of the people. And then he goes in and sprinkles that on the mercy seat. And that is the way God had fit Israel to be in his presence by removing their sin through this, this symbol of what Christ would do. But Christ did not need to be cleansed himself, Hebrews 5.3 says. Christ goes in not in a, a, a tabernacle made with hands, but into very heaven itself and offers his blood, the perfect blood, who is pro priest and sacrifice and needs no cleansing and therefore he is the final sacrifice for all sin. The blood of Christ is pure, so pure as to cleanse many nations and even your heart and even your sins. God had made Christ's extreme suffering the very measure of his qualification to be the one who cleanses the nations. What the world ought to have worshipped, they revile. They revile in their rejection and stopped ears, but don't think we don't revile him too, in our own way. Whenever we are ashamed of the clean and pure words of the gospel, whenever we sin, we revile him. Remember the miracle, though, that God justifies the ungodly? His sin, his, his forgiveness is enough for you to be justified. His forgiveness, his work, his blood is enough to, to bring you to a place where God will declare you for Christ's sake righteous. Why would it be different for anyone else in your life? We are all Justified by the same blood, God is no respecter of persons. That's the reaction of revulsion. There's the, another action in verse, uh, verse 15, the last three lines of verse 15. The reaction of submission to the revelation of the gospel. It starts out with the phrase, kings will shut their mouths on account of him. The kings here are best to be seen as all of the kings of the world. The whole, um, all of the wisdom of the world, all of the power of the world, all of the greatness of the world gathered into one place. And what did they ask? How could guilt be taken away by the blood of a broken man on a cross of shame? 
How could our evil be judged by a servant who bore that very evil in his own suffering and death? Well, all the wisdom of man is shut off when they see the reversal of things as the one who is thought to be unclean now, now becomes the one who shuts the mouths of all of the worldly wisdom. And then says, not only that, but you kings of the earth shall learn of the gospel someday. We read from Romans 15 how Paul <clears throat> testifies of his motivation to preach to the ends of the earth, to those who had not heard the gospel. You sitting in this pew are fulfillment of that very promise. For what had not been told them, they will see. And what had not been heard, they will understand. He was thinking of the glorious church throughout the world that would gather from people from all nations, tribes, and tongues. So the worldwide consequences of the servant's suffering at the hands of those who disregarded him is that the kings of the earth shall learn the gospel, the people of the earth shall learn the gospel, and all the wisdom of the world could never have thought of how to remove guilt like this. For what they had not been told, and for what they had not been heard, that is going to be revealed in the next three stanzas of this great song of the suffering servant. It is the work of Christ laid out for us, but for the joy set before him, he endured the cross and despised the shame, so that the sufferings of one man, Jesus Christ, have done what the whole realm of wisdom failed to do, and that is to bear guilt away. Okay, so action by God to exalt his servant Christ. Reaction of revulsion of the world toward the servant, which results in his suffering. And that suffering turned into power in the reaction of others who receive the revelation of God in the word of God and submit to it. That God has revealed the good news to us as a person and not a set of principles or a bunch of rules or a certain code of conduct or a philosophical slant is the surest and unfailingest way to bring the good news to us. For a code can be broken. A philosophy can be violated. A code of conduct can be ignored. But the ever reigning, ever glorious, ever successful, all powerful, truly alive today, interceding, powerful, glorious Jesus Christ can never be broken. All other attempts at salvations fail in the glory and majesty of his cross. The miracle of God in saving sinners is profound when you think just how unreachable people really are. Have you ever won an argument with an unbeliever you have shared the gospel with and had them say, oh, you're right. I'll just come and repent right now. No, we don't operate that way. The human heart is the purview of God and God alone, and the Holy Spirit will move that heart to believe. Because there is only one treatment for guilt. Um, last couple summers ago, um, the Bessettes and uh, us, so we went out to see Macbeth. Uh, the, the great Shakespearean play. And um, there's a scene I love in, in, the, in the play where um, Macbeth, his wife, is trying to wash her hands of the guilty spot that she has on her hands. And you'll, if you'll excuse me, I'm quoting exactly from Shakespeare here. She is overwhelmed by guilt and her part in the murder and moaning, out damn spot, out I say, 
Here is the smell of blood still. All the perfumes of Arabia will not sweeten this little hand. And as Macbeth sees his wife coming unglued over her guilt and under so much pain, he says to a doctor that he's called to care for her, and canst thou not minister to a mind diseased? Pluck from her memory a rooted sorrow, raise out the written troubles of the brain with some sweet oblivious anecdote, antidote to cleanse the stuffed bosom of that perilous stuff which weighs upon the heart. Shakespeare had a way with words. If you know the play, you know how the doctor replied. He replies the way the world always replies. Therein the patient must minister to himself. That is the answer in some way or form that the world gives for guilt always to us. Self-medicate with uh, some sweet, oblivious anecdote. Um, entertain yourself, overwork yourself, over-romance yourself, over-achieve. Anything to not think about the guilt. God says, though, Behold my servant. Watch and listen. Remember when I said in Israel on the Day of Atonement, the, the, the priest would go and lay hands on a goat? What he would do when he did that was in fact to transfer the sin of God's people to the goat, to the scapegoat. Jesus, the exalted one, because of his cross and resurrection, offers himself as that scapegoat for our sin. By fulfilling the law, finally, in his work on the cross. It is not a remedy for guilty feelings, but for fitting us to be in God's presence for eternity. This is the way our guilt has been taken away, not by some sweet, oblivious antidote. I owe this to, uh, to, Ray, to Ray Ortland, this uh, phrase. No sweet, oblivious antidote of the world will help. So won't you now end the cover-up of your ungodliness? Won't you now react to his exalted majesty and believe this wisdom revealed in Christ? Won't you now, now turn from sin of reviling and run and lay your hands on the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world? Let us pray. O oh Lord, we have entered into your gates with thanksgiving and into your courts with praise. We, we have seen that you have made us glad by the declaration and hearing of the gospel of Jesus Christ. With the wisdom you have made known to us and the grace that you have given into our hearts, may we live out the word. May we be doers of it and not merely hearers. And by the might of the matchless name of Christ, who is our sacrifice, our substitute, we pray in his name. Amen. Please uh, rise and we'll sing number 255, O Jesus, we adore thee. Number 255.
Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May he make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and grant you peace. Amen. Thank you.